Um, huge time of warfare. Just FYI, right? How many of you know that? <laughs> Feeling it, okay. Last week we had some amazing things happen here. Great ministry time, worship, word went forward. And this last week, I think we had nine total that were here. All of us got nailed with flu. Just boom, 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 boom. I was the first one that went down that night hard. A bunch of you prayed for me. And today, it was just, I was like so dragging. You know, we're praying for Jim and Helen. They, they got hit with that. Gene Jack, I mean, just Debbie, it's just all, all sorts of folks. Mm -hmm. So um, the battle's been raging so much that we reached out to our, the folks that we're aligned with, Glory of Zion in Texas, through one of their, really their lead intercessor in Tate. And Kim was able to talk with her and give her some details. And then she said, we basically, you know, I'm paraphrasing from Kim, but they are seeing this all over the place. And it's a threefold cord of attack. It's spirits of infirmity, poverty, and religion. And those three intertwine and come in, okay? And they'll reinforce each other. You're sick because you're poor, you're poor because you should be, right? I mean, that's the, where the religious spirit kind of thing comes in. And will keep us locked out of, often in poverty or infirmity because it says, well, Jesus might do that, but not for you. Okay, so the battle is on. And uh, today, I mean, it was just like, I was so just toast. And Kim was like, boy, maybe we should cancel. Maybe we should cancel. You're just not, you know, and everybody's got so many people sick. And I'm like, you know what? I can't, I have to press through this, right? So I'm not, I don't have a fever, so you don't have to worry about it, okay? I don't really believe that I'm contagious, but I'm not hugging on people like I normally do just because I'm trying to be smart in that part. But then because of that, preparing and everything was just a real challenge. And I wanted to make sure that we're here today because I feel like this date is important that we've just come through. We're, we're, we talked about this last week. We're in God's first month, and to me, this picture really captures it. There's a lot of hammering going on, but actually, it's not the enemy. It's God doing the hammering, right? It's a month when we see the buildup of Passover and all the tension that's leading to that, and we see that also then with Jesus and all the stress that goes on during that same time. But we see that God's already got it worked out. He's got a plan. He knows that Pharaoh's hardness is actually going to work against him. He knows that Judas's betrayal and the hardness of the heart of the Pharisees and the Sadducees will all work ultimately for what God wants out of that. And so there's a hammering going on, and we often feel like it's in the process, but there's something that God's doing to restore us. Yeah? You good with that? Okay. Dave's word. You know, we got to... Don't be standing against the wind. Go, go see where God's blowing us, right? That wind blowing against the sand. We've got to go by how the Spirit's blowing us. And it's this time of the Lamb and the Lion of Judah. So Jesus comes in. He is the Lamb. We know that, the Passover Lamb. But it's also the month of Judah. The tribe of Judah is the first tribe. And Judah's first in worship, first in warfare. Who shall we send to go into battle? Send Judah. Send Judah. Send Judah. So... You know, we've sent out some word even about Jim and Helen, and Jim is doing okay in the hospital. We need to keep praying for him um, to get this pneumonia completely out. But it just comes down, every time it's just, I'm trying to just praise his, you know, praise the Lord for Jim, in Jim. Helen was up there this afternoon, he was having a tough time breathing, but when she put her hand on his heart, she just started praising God and blessing it. He just started to breathe easier and went to sleep. And so, you know, she's seeing that. So we're, we're in a battle. But in this first month, then we get to the first month and the 10th day, and that is today. Actually, we're just closing that out now. Today is the 10th day of Nisan, the first month. And there are, are references. I sent this out in the ping. But just so you're clear, the first time we see this is in Exodus 12. And we're going to cover that. But it's about the lamb selection. You inspect, you choose, you receive it. And then there's an age and a quality and a quantity question. And then we go almost to the far end down here to Luke. And now Luke 19 is one of the telling of the triumphal entry, right? It's in Mark and other places. But this happens also on Lamb Selection Day, on the 10th of Nisan. Because Jesus comes in the triumphal entry. He goes in through by the sheep gate. This is, if you want to read commentaries again and again and again, they will tell you the timing of this because we know it's the final setup. Part of the coming in is for the disciples to prepare for the Passover table and everything else. So we've got the lamb here. We've got the lamb there. 
and he is ultimately the people's choice in the triumphant entry, right? There's a selection process that goes on. So we're going to just touch on that. But in the middle of this sandwich is this account right here, which is in Joshua 3 and 4. And again, it specifies in the first month and the 10th day. God's calendar, God's linking this. And it's about Joshua and the Jordan, the priests and the ark, getting your feet wet, and then cutting the river. And then finally, that there's setting stones in place. So we're going we're gonna to touch on some of this. I hope it will make some sense. I want to tie this in, though. It ultimately all goes back to the lamb. You get that, right? The lamb, the lamb. But you have to understand, we can see the lamb so often in the salvation story. I think God ties it in here to the next part of the story unequivocally. Do you understand? Because a whole boatload of people have gotten from Egypt into the wilderness. But then a whole lot of people get stuck there and never cross again. There are two crossings required. And we're not talking about the second one being death. Because in death, there will be no warfare, right? Once you're on the other side of that. And when they cross, they cross into warfare. So I hope I can communicate this adequately, but I'm not sure. You're used to a whole lot of fancy slides. Sorry, you're going to get a little bit more just kind of playing up stuff. Okay? So, Hannah, you're there. You would get that word. Why don't you lead out and read here, if you would. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Okay, who set the state? God did, right? He reordered time for Moses. He said you're going to reorder it, but it's very interesting. He says first you're going to reorder it, and then the very first thing he gives him is this date. Do you think this has importance? Yes. Okay, not only are you going to remember the month, but I need to give you a specific date in this month. What is 10 a number of? Commandment. It's commandment. Okay, what's the other? It's one other thing. Law. 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 Okay. The teaching. It has to do a lot with when God has, to, there's a judgment aspect to it. Okay. The 10 virgins, right, with the oil. Mm -hmm. The 10 spies that go out. 10 often gets connected with, because remember the 10 virgins, right? Five with, five without. What's the occasion? Who comes back? The bride, the bridegroom, rather. Okay? And so they're to get ready. And there's an there's a assessment that goes on during there. So 10 is a sense of the judgment coming down. So there is, can you see that already in the 10th month, choosing out the Passover lamb? But look at this a little bit more. Keep reading, Hannah. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, have then taken into account the number of people there are. If you are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat, the animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, and when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. What is the 14th of the month at twilight? Passover, Passover right? It is at that occasion that it happens. Okay, so you see that there's a selection process. I'm going to pull out some, some points out of this in a second, but all I want to do now is overlay one of the retelling, okay, of when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. So who can read this? You close? They yep. brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Okay? Mm -hmm. I've brought this narrative here for another reason, and that's because there's stones in this narrative. <laughs> and there's going to be stones in the Joshua story as well. So I just, to me, I always kind of am amused how God will connect various dots. But let's just look at this briefly. In the Exodus, you have a deadline issue. God sets a schedule. 
it's very specific on this tenth day and there's a verse that says somewhere at just the right time Jesus died for the ungodly right there is a setting of a schedule that God wants to move in there's a selection process it's a personal issue where he said each man selects right we think of Jesus he is the Passover lamb but you have to understand there was this intimate thing of each man selecting a sheep and then out of that there was a question of sufficiency you have to make sure there is enough for your household right if there's too much then you can share with somebody else if not then there's got to get, get more but having everybody had to have enough to eat and there was a quantity issue a quality issue right age and perfect was Jesus of the right age okay I'm just you're gonna connect the dots right there's an intimacy issue because the family very interesting why didn't God just say on the morning of the 14th day you pick out a lamb and on the afternoon you sacrifice it okay it's it's yeah it's that he wants you to, they take the lamb and then they take it in the household with them it's very intimate it's very personal it's not okay it, it, it's an understanding that you actually take this one in as part of you because he's going to be responsible now for covering the sin that would then the angel of death would pass over so this isn't removed it's a personal choice and then finally there's a death row issue because he's marked for sacrifice and we're back to the deadline thing again and we have an exodus but then we have an entrance that's brought right here with Jesus coming in on the donkey all these same things apply the deadline issue there's a personal issue see the people are crying out and and the, and the Pharisees are upset and he's saying you don't understand it they have to they're selecting me as king yeah. and did you know that the palms were a very radical symbol too? the palms were at times I read one thing that said they were controversial to use palms in Jerusalem because they were seen as a sign of the zealots okay about for the king and so there and then the question is does Jesus sufficient is there going to be sufficient of the lamb for all who are there right more than sufficient I am the bread that comes down from heaven is he of the right age and with and perfect yes and he's going to be inspected isn't he He's going to go in there and the scholars and the scribes are going to go after him. And then there's a question about them being taken in. And Jesus is taken into Jerusalem. You get that? He's been there many times, but not before in this kind of grand way that he's presented on Lamb Selection Day. And he comes in by the Sheep Gate and he is selected and he's chosen. And they're saying he's ours. And, but there's a death row issue that he's marked for sacrifice. What an odd thing that must have had to been for Jesus to go in. How, how do you receive that praise and be in that moment knowing what's around the corner? How do you know that the very people that are saying Hosanna in the highest are going to say, kill him? We won Barabbas. You know, I, I, I don't know how you... Okay. But I want you to see this framework that's set around on this day, 3,500 years ago, plus or minus when, when God said, 10th day, first month, select the Lamb. And 1,500 years or so after that, Jerusalem does. And yet the realities are all these sort of play in in every person's decision, right? That's the whole thing, is that we have this choice now. It's presented. It's a question, will you take him? God's got a schedule. Each man has to select. Some don't select Jesus. They try to find something else to be their Passover lamb. Something else that will get them by. Something else that will get them life. He is more than sufficient. Most of the stuff we try to take on otherwise is not sufficient. So often it's corroded. It's too young. It's too old. It's something. We often, we will take whatever we choose. We will take it in. And there's a death row coming. The question is, what's going to be killed, right? What's going to pay the price? So context, yeah? Are you, all, you okay? Okay. And you know, again, we, uh, I'm grateful that we honor Palm Sunday 
right? We, we, we get out of sync with God's timing on things because we want it to all work a certain way for our, our gathering schedule. And God's just like, yeah, well, that's, okay, that's fine. I just, I've got my own, so I'm gonna track on that. But do you understand why it felt so important that we had to gather today? Even if it was like, I knew a lot of people were out and sick and wasn't feeling great, but it's like, no, we still have to meet. And then you enter into this scene. This is a stained glass window out of Edinburgh, Scotland, and that depicts Joshua. So Joshua is in the center there, right, leading. Of course, it's always funny because they make it very medieval rather than making it all appropriate. But then you've got the priests carrying the ark on their shoulders, and the far side there, you've got them doing what? Can you tell what that is? What, what are they doing? Maybe you can't see it. Well, they're not washing their feet, but they're doing something. What are they, what's the blue thing? Picking up rocks. How many got the ping? How many of you read Joshua 3 and 4? Okay, see, we're, we're going to have to go over that. Okay, well, we'll clarify that story. I'm going to jump right down now to this part. Who can read it loud? Dave, can you read this loud? Uh, because this is in, I want to give you the date because the date comes near the end of the narrative and then we're going to go back and do it, but I want you to see again where this comes in. Dave? On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. Okay, now stop. If you didn't know anything at all about Jesus, but you're a good Jew, right? You're a good Hebrew or you're trying to follow this God, Yahweh, right? And you read this and somewhere early you're going, wait a minute, Exodus, first month, tenth day, because you know you don't always see a whole lot of dates, right? Sometimes the references to the month and the dates are not that many, but when they're there, it's like, okay. And when they're the same one, then you have to just stop and go, whoa, back up. So what you're telling me is on the very day prior to them leaving, that God had the same exact, something happen on that day, on the same exact day. There's something significant about this, right? Just so you understand? And so you stop and go, there's a link here between the exodus out of Egypt and the entrance into the promise. And they're two separate occasions, but they happen, they get triggered on the same date. Okay, Dave, keep going. And Joshua set up at Gilgal 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean, tell them. Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you crossed over. The Lord your God did, did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Oh, that's more. Okay. What were the two reasons? Right at the end. So that all the peoples of the earth might know the hand of the Lord of God is powerful. One separate thing. You've got to understand the power of God. But secondly, that what? Who? Fear. Fear. Who? Who might? People. Pe people. Not people. Not people. That who might? You might. Who is he talking to? Everybody. No, he's talking to the Israelites, to his people. You have to understand there's a place in which all of the earth has to know that he is majestic and powerful, but the worship is called up from his people. Okay. Do you get right? All people should and all are invited to, but it's specifically and said, you are my remnant. And I've done this that the earth would know. You know, there's, I guess maybe, let me just read. You okay if I read a little bit to you? Okay. It's just too much to try to put up on all the screen. Um, but let's go here. You have to remember, there's two bodies of water involved in these two narratives. One is a sea and one is a river. They're not the, they're, they're not the same. They both have issues, but they're different. And they're different types of what we have to transition through in our faith walk. The reality is most people come through the equivalent of the Red Sea and never go through the equivalent of the Jordan. Many people 
of our faith who want to follow Jesus have some understanding about coming through the Red Sea and of Passover, they don't understand that they're also required to come through the Jordan. There's just so much right here. But let me, I, I love the word, just so let me, let me read some of this. I'm going to actually read this whole chapter then. Then Joshua rose early in the morning. He and all the sons of Israel set off from Shittim and came to the Jordan, and they lodged there before they crossed. So this is not yet at the tenth. And it came about at the end of three days that the officers went throughout the midst of the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priests carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there shall be distance between you and a distance of about 2,000 cubits, how long is a cubit? 18 inches. 18 inches, right, from here to here. So about 3,000 feet. Pretty good distance, huh? How far, how much of a mile would that have been? Uh, two quarters, three, yeah. three fifths. Yeah, two thirds, three quarters of a mile. Okay, some distance between the ark, right? Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you shall go for you have not passed this way before. In other words, right, they're going, they've not been this way before. There's going to be a new path. And they're going to have to give God a, just enough head start so they can track with where the ark's going. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant and cross over ahead of the people. So they went up, so they took up the ark of the covenant and went ahead of the people. Now the Lord said, to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. Purpose for God doing this big sign in part? Mm -hmm. Establishing Joshua, right? Moses got them out, but couldn't get them in. Right? right? There's a coming out and there's a going in. The problem is that a lot of come out and then they get stuck in the staging area. You shall, moreover, command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. How different was this from the way they came out? The when, sea opened up before they even had to step in. Right, and how did they open? Moses. Moses what? Staff. Okay, Moses the staff. staff. Moses' staff. Yeah, and he just held it up there, right? And the Lord sent a wind and blew that open. But now, rather than being separate, they're just passively waiting and God does all the stuff. What's the difference now? How involved do the people have to be? Put their feet in. Put their feet in. But not just put their feet in, right? Who puts their feet in? The priests. And what are the priests carrying? They carry that the okay, and how dangerous was that? Um, very dangerous. How do you know that? Yeah, standing in the river with an ark, but even, even apart from the danger of the water, how do you know the ark is dangerous? Okay, you're right, right? Handling it a little too casually. Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, Come here and he come near and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will assuredly dispossess from you the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Hivite, the Parasite, the Gigashite, the Amorite, and the Jebusite. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now then, take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man for each tribe. And it shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off and the waters which are flowing down from above shall stand in one heap. I need you to just get a couple of things. This whole thing is about possessing of the land. You've got to know this. I'm going to give this as a demonstration so that you can move out in confidence of what you're about to get. But not only that, every time when God is doing a covenant, the word that he uses is he cuts a covenant. Okay? What's interesting is that same word comes in here as to what he's going to do with the river. He's going to cut off that river. 
and it's going to mound up in a wall. It's going to stand at a distance from him. The Red Sea, he just blew on it, and it created like two walls of water, and they walked in between them. In this case, he's literally going to cut it off and just wall it up one other place. It's like he's cutting a path through, and it's reminding us again, it's about covenant, it's about covenant, it's about covenant, because they're taking the Ark of Covenant before them. So it came about when the people set out from their tents to carry the Jordan with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And when those who carried the Ark came into the Jordan and the feet of the priests carrying the Ark were dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of harvest, that the waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap a great distance away at Adam, the city which is beside Zarathon, and those which were flowing down toward the sea of Arabah, the salt sea, were completely cut off, so the people crossed opposite Jericho. And the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel crossed on dry ground, until all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Wow. We're talking about a million people? We're talking closer to two to three million people. So it took them a few days to cross? No, because it all happens in one day. One day. On uh, one day. They must have walked real fast. They, it, well, it says actually, yeah. And here it says the nation finished. Uh, it talked about that they made haste to cross over. So they were, you know, they were moving because you got these guys with the ark, right, in the middle of it. You got this wall of water, and you can see. I, I'd be intrigued to see what that wall of water looked like. Well, enough, because meanwhile, there's more water flowing down that river. It's in flood stage. You have to remember. The Jordan is very different in different stages. In fact, that photo that I showed you with the, with the uh, tank crossing a river, I said crossing your Jordan, that actually was a picture of an IDF, an Israeli Defense Force tank, crossing part of the Jordan River. Okay, I mean, I wasn't just being cute. It was an actual crossing there. But there's times and places when the Jordan is fairly easy to transverse. But during the harvest time, it's at full bore. So it's rushing down, so God just cuts it he cuts it and he just walls it off there. And so they're seeing that go. <laughs> now remember, this is a generation, some of them would have been kids when they'd come across. All the adults had died off, right? Because the adults refused to cross over mm -hmm. when God had said. So it's like, okay, fine, you stay here in your unbelief. I'm going to raise up the next generation who will believe me and appropriate all that I've got for them. So that's going on. And meanwhile, then all these people are like, okay, let's go this time. They were hurrying. They were hurrying. Well, they were trusting God, but they were also I mean, you know, it's come on. Like, the, the they were going. Now listen, now it came about when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Jonah saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So God wants them to take a memorial, right? From the very place in the middle, not from the edges, from right where the priests were standing in the middle of it. I want 12 stones. These are 12 stones that have been in that riverbed for we don't know how long. But did you see in that stained glass kind of the size of it? Because the Lord says he wants them to put them on their shoulders. So it's not like each guy got up and, okay, I, I got my deal here. It was, they had to be big enough to put on your shoulder because they're going to build a memorial it's going to stand as a testimony that's going to say, remember, remember, remember. So Joshua called the twelve men from whom he had appointed one uh, from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross again to the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this sign be among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, Because of the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Lord, before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. And thus the sons of Israel did, as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, just as the Lord spoke to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. And they carried them over with them to the lodging place and put them down there. But then listen to this part here. Because this is something else God didn't actually instruct, but that Joshua does. 
Then Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they are there to this day. So 12 stones were carried over onto the shore, but 12 stones were taken from the shore and put into the middle. So they would be covered and stand as a testimony. Stephen, interestingly, 12 stones were representing the Israelite tribes, also 12 stones Aaron wore. That's right. Representing the 12 tribes. That's right. That's right. And it says, for instance, that those 12 are to be a memorial before the Lord so that when Aaron stands before the Lord, he is bringing all the 12 tribes before the Lord. Yes. They're the same way as they're a memorial for the Lord. So a memorial for the people and a memorial before the Lord. So yeah, they stand as, as testimony. Do you also, then suddenly you kind of connect a dot with what Jesus would say, if these people are quiet, the very stones will cry out. Yes. They're a witness to what's happened. Testament is also a testimony, that's right. Mm -hmm. So, for the priests who carried the ark were standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was completed that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua, and the people hurried and crossed. They're sure, okay? And it came about when all the people had finished crossing that the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed before the people. And the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over in battle array before the sons of Israel, just as Moses had spoken to them, about 40,000 equipped for war, crossed for battle before the Lord to the desert plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel so that they revered him just as they had revered Moses all the days of his life. Now the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests who carry the ark of the testimony that they come up from the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests saying, come up from the Jordan. And it came about when the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord had come up from the middle of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted to the dry ground, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their banks and went over all its banks as before. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth of the first month and camped at Gilgal. Yeah? Word of the Lord? Okay, so let's try to just pull out a couple things here. I need you to keep in mind that there are two crossings. There's a crossing that comes out of Passover that gets you out of Egypt, out of Pharaoh's camp, out of bondage into freedom, but it's you're taken out to something to go, from something to go to it, and the wilderness wasn't the two place, right? It was a temporary place. And the promise, meanwhile, partially fulfilled, but it awaits, it awaits, it awaits, right? The whole idea is I will deliver you from to this. And so it's out there, and it's the same way in the body of Christ today, but there is a barrier in the way, and the Jordan represents, we'll, we'll talk briefly about that, but both the Red Sea and the Jordan, water in large quantity is usually seen as a place of judgment. Okay, when God wanted to judge the earth in Noah, what did he do? The Sends the flood. Okay, if you look at Jonah and what happened to Jonah being judged, and what does he say about it? He says, the water swirled over my head. You can read David in the Psalms again and again. A large quantity of water, like a flood, is seen as, as judging. Okay, there's a thing that we have to pass through. We have to pass through the judgment that is outside of Egypt for having been into the slavery and passed through that. But there's a second level that we have to go through, which is the Jordan. There's two parts. So I don't know that I'm gonna do all this rel, so again, you're okay so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. So why would the Red Sea when we cross that? We're crossing into salvation. We're crossing into salvation and we're crossing into the objective, or the, the objective fact that there is nothing you can do to earn your salvation, is there? No. Is there anything you've done to earn your salvation? It's just, it's an objective thing that God has done for you. Here you go, it's a gift. Yeah. Yeah. Take it, that is that part of the cross that we just received, thank you Lord. But there is more to it, okay? That's there, there's, that's the other part. So, timing is always an issue with crossing. There's a question of the means of getting through there's a memorial that's created, and then there's a question about what's next, because the problem is too often we cross through something and we think we're done, and there's a what's next. 
that's out there. So, there's a necessity of two crossings for Israel. Would you agree? Yes. How many of them make the second crossing? Sorry? The parents don't. There's a whole, there's a whole generation that do not because of Kadesh Barnea, right? So there's a second generation, but that second generation, someone would have been born, but some of them would have actually come out of Egypt. But regardless, because God brought their forefathers, they have been sanctified through that, right? They have been set aside. They have been saved through that. Now they've got to go a second one. And so it's at flood stage when things are really intense and crazy with the Jordan. It's funny that God doesn't take them through a lighter time because he's got to make sure they understand it's by divine means. And then the who and the what and the where come into this, right? What is that? Okay, what were the contents within? The Ten Commandments. Okay. Aaron, Aaron, staff of Moses. Okay, this is not the staff of Moses, but Aaron, the staff, Aaron, staff of Aaron, Aaron, manna, and the tablets, right? Okay, good. You got it. So, manna being the bread. Sorry? The staff had budded. The staff had budded. Let, let, I'm going to come right back to that in a second. So, the manna is the bread of heaven. Who does. Now, just connect the dots, right? Who is the manna from heaven? Jesus. Jesus, right? He speaks of that in John that your fathers ate in the manna in the desert and they died. I am the true bread that comes down from heaven, right? So, the ark is a type for Jesus. Secondly, you mentioned Aaron's rod, but in bud. What's the significance about the fact that it budded? Life. Okay, it was life, but what was the occasion? Uh, they were Sorry. questioning who was going to be the high priest. They were questioning who is in authority. Who really has the authority to go before the priest, right? He says, fine, lay down all your staffs and Aaron's buds. There's a question of alignment in here. There were many religious leaders in the time of Christ, right? The question is, who's got the authority? Where is the life, as Scotty said? In whose staff is the life? Who is the one that God has said, this is my one? This is my high priest. Do you see again why the budded rod is important here? And then what's next? The tablets, right? That had what? Okay, they had the Torah, the teaching of the Lord. The utterance of the Lord saying, here is my covenant. Has that covenant been done away with? No, it gets fulfilled, okay? We walk in, we're grafted into. Those are still walking with us today because we know that is the doctor's prescription for our health and life. But then two other things. What was this carried upon? It didn't just float out there. Poles. Poles, okay. But who carried the poles? Shoulders. The shoulders of who? Priests. Of the priests. Those who were called, who set aside. And what are you called? A royal priesthood. priesthood. A holy nation under the Lord God, right? So this is a type of Christ. The ark is of Christ, but then even more, what was resting right there? What's that place called? The mercy seat. The mercy seat. And what went upon that to make it clean? Two cherubim. Two cherubim. Two cherubim. They overshadowed it, right? But what had to be put up there each year after year? The blood. The blood. The blood of what? The lamb. The lamb, right? There were two, two goats, actually, that would go in there. One was the scapegoat. The other was to be used. And that blood sacrifice was to go up there and to cleanse the mercy seat. So you see, this is a type of Christ, but it's not a type that just sits on the side of the shore. It's not a type with, with Moses running, holding his Aaron, right? It's a type that is to be carried into the middle of judgment, of death, of risk, of the waters at flood time of saying, okay, I'm going to step in with a power far greater than me, a presence far more than I am. But I carry it. There's a participative part in this. So the contents within, it's carried upon, but resting then in that is the mercy of God, the mercy of God, the mercy of God. But again, we see where the, the lamb that is selected, the goat that is selected, and how that comes again to cleanse this part. And then the question then about participating. It's water, yes, but it's not the Red Sea now, it's the Jordan. And it's the Red Sea versus the Jordan. And the first use of the Jordan River is back in Genesis when Abraham and Lot are together and they've grown too big, right? Mm -hmm. And so what does Abraham do? Gives him the best. What's he do? He doesn't give him the best. He gives him, he gives him what? A choice. A choice. And who's choosing? Lot. Lot is. Now tell me what Lot embodies versus Abraham. Okay, very much the world, right? Kind of a fleshly orientation to life. Mm -hmm. So Lot looks out, and what side of the Jordan does he look at that he takes? He takes the east. The commercial part. He takes the east part. The part where Israel already was, frankly, right now in the wilderness. 
the fleshly man chooses that part. You got to go through the Jordan to get to the inheritance of the spiritual man who is Abraham. Do you understand? Why is it that Jesus has to get baptized in the Jordan River? And not in the Red Sea or something. Do you see, there's a, there's a going down and a submitting under it, but now the waters don't part. What parts? The heavens part, right? And what comes and rests on him? All, all his spirit. All this stuff is typed together. So the Spirit comes down to empower Jesus to do a way that's not the way of man, even though he aligned fully with God, but he had to wait until the Spirit came to be launched fully into the ministry and the mandate that he had. Not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit. And Jesus therefore says to them, do not leave until the power of you have been clothed from the power from on high. Because otherwise we're always going to try to do the mission of Jesus in the flesh, in the logic, in the reasonableness of it all. And it ain't going to cut it. That's us in the wilderness. We believe we've gotten out of Egypt, but now we keep on trying to do it in our own way. Because Egypt is still clinging too much to us. We're no longer in that environment, but we still keep acting out that way. So the necessity of going through a Jordan is to be willing. The cross has been applied to us. But then there's a question of whether or not we will submit to the cross. Unless you pick up your cross, but what's there's one word there. Unless you up your pro, pick up your cross daily. daily. You see, there's a twofold work, right? The first is, is the objective part of the cross is applied to you. It's just a gift, but then Jesus says, you need to now pick this up daily. This is that Jordan. This is a moving out of the flesh and then moving into the spirit way. And it's why I think that God links both of those Passovers to the 10th day of the first month. But they're both connected back to the Lamb. You're not going to do it without the Lamb. You're not going to do it without the cross. It's always the cross. But in this case, do you see this guy's feet in the water? Because he's going to be carrying something. The first you are carried through, God just opens up the sea. The second you have to agree and partner with God for what's next. God, you're just going to have to do it all. And God's like, yeah, well, we're going to have to work, you know. Right? We are, we've been graded for years by those things like by Paul says, work, therefore work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What? Sounds like works to me. So those yeah. priests just stood there all day holding that thing up. <laughs> what an anointing on them. What? They had to be. They had to be. Yes. And meanwhile they're going, so Mac, how are you doing up there? Okay, so don't so touch the ark. Okay. <laughs> hey man, I really got to lean. Don't touch the ark, dude. Don't, don't, don't touch the ark. There's two sets of stones. There's a set that go and are covered again under the water that represent Israel. That's the part that doesn't make it across. That's the death part that gets buried under the water. That's the part that stays in judgment. But there's a part that comes through the water that is rescued from that and set aside now as a memorial, as a sign. This is another covenant sign, Gail. Remember the various signs? This, that word for the memorial equates with sign for them. By the way, why did God not have them do this in the Red Sea? Why didn't he have them take rocks out and put a memorial in the wilderness? Because they're not supposed to stay there. You don't want your children seeing that pile of stones if you've done it in the wilderness because that means you're stuck. But in the Promised Land, that way they will remember how they got here so they will have the courage to fight. Those stones also like how we die in baptism. Right. Go ahead, say more. Yes, because we, that's right. I'm reminded of when they said, hey, when you're baptized, you're dying to your old self. There you go. Exactly. You go down in the water, your, your old self dies, and the 12 tribes to bat died there, and the fresh right. ones. Died. There you go. Are you catching all this? Yeah. And how interesting that God would link all of this in to the same time of Passover, because he's saying, remember, you're saved from in order for something. Not just so that you have a free pass and run around like a crazy, stupid person doing whatever the heck you want. I have a life for you. I have an assignment. Yes, yes. I have a glory on your life. Hallelujah. I have more than needs to be done. So, Egypt, wilderness, promised land, slavery under Pharaoh. They got freedom through Moses, but they move into dominion through Joshua. 
Joshua means what? What was Jesus? Yeah, what does it mean? Yes, and what, how do you pronounce it? Yeshua. Yeshua, which happens to be Jesus' name, right? Yeah. We're to move in full dominion. And then there's the rod is at the shore, but the ark is in the water. Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. Israel has to go through the Jordan to get to the promise. So, I love this thing from this, this quote, this guy out in, in the Netherlands about the objective and subjective sides of the cross. The Red Sea says, Christ died for you, and you died with him. The Jordan says, because you died with him, let sin no longer reign in your mortal bodies. Do you, do you get that? Yeah. The great purpose of crossing the Jordan is Ephesians 4.13, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. When I was in Israel in the Navy, we had 16 guys that got baptized in the Jordan River. And that river was filthy. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't care. They were so shocked by it. They went back to ship them. And they all got their shot through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they were determined that they were going to be baptized in the Jordan River. And the chaplain yeah. yeah. baptized all 16 of them. Yeah. One at a time or all? One at a time. Okay. So here's the question. What, what is your Jordan now? But here's my question. If, if there is that second application of Jordan, and Jesus says, unless you pick up your cross. Uh, so what? Okay. Uh, let me do a check in time here. I want to make sure you're still, still with me. Yeah, you're getting this? So what I want to say is, as much as the IDF was able to use this means for you know, crossing the tank over, this is not what you're allowed to do. Sorry. <laughs> is that a real picture? That's a real picture. This is, this is the IDF crossing the Jordan River at one point. That's how I found the picture. I put crossing Jordan into a, a search base and they got pictures and that's the title of the of this picture. Uh, no, that, that those things are pretty pretty sharp. Yeah, but you've got to imagine that the Jordan now can you see over the far side where there's some tanks up there? There you're getting more of what it would be at flood stage. Do you see what I'm saying? You start moving this past the riverbank over there to the edge of where those hills come down, and now you're, you're getting a better approximation. You have to understand how wide that Jordan River would have become. So, principles out of this. Flood level. A Jordan has a flood level. What is it that you're confronting that you're afraid of that's going to kill you? But you need to step through that in order to get to the promise. What are you going to have to leave behind? You understand there is always a death involved in something, but it's typically always, always, it's a death to self of something. This is the way I thought it would be. This is the way it should be, but I'm holding on to this resentment or unforgiveness or whatever it is. There is a flood level that God says, okay, if you want the other promise, if you want the fullness of this, you're going to have to get fully immersed into the Jordan. I will make a way for you, but you're going to have to decide. There are no bypass bridges. It's a pass-through only. And you have to step in the rush. He didn't force the priest to wade all the way through, right? He says, you get in there, you start, I'll meet you. Yeah. Okay? He didn't say, well, once you start floating downstream, I'll grab it. And he said, if you will do this, I will meet you there. But then you must continue because there's no going back. Once you cross, you cross. And then the question is, what do you carry, right? If the ark is a type of Jesus, then we're so aware that the covenant promise is carried here. The mercy seat is something I'm constantly accessing by the blood of Jesus. There is the provision of God. I'm in right alignment under the great high priest. And I have the word is written within my heart. The promise of Joel, that covenant. So with that, Okay, Lord, we're doing this together. I am picking up my cross. The cross carries all of that. And then the stones that I leave are the things that have to be left in the water to die. I'm leaving a memorial of what was is no more. And then the stones that I take out of the middle of that journey, out of that encounter with God. Have any of you ever had a wrestling match with God where you had to die to what you wanted? Did you have a memorial from that wrestling match? Could you remember? You remember it clearly, right? Man, I remember some stuff that was just like, it was, it was knocked down, drag out. 
And then the Lord would then afterwards give me a word that became a memorial, something that I could hold and build. This very thing that we're in is part of that, by the way. And then the memorial is set. The memorial is there to remind them always, always the mighty hand of God and that you should revere me because if I brought you over, I'm going to give you this land. I didn't bring you here to kill you. I didn't bring you here just to sit still. I brought you here. There's more to do, but it's so I can give you the rest of that. And then it is always then this, do you know what I mean by the subjective side versus the objective side? Objective is something that's simply given to you, the work of the cross, your salvation. The subjective is then you pick up and embrace for the fullness of Christ to work in you. It's okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's working in partnership with God. And the lamb, the lamb, the lamb frames either side of this lamb selection day. It is only by the lamb that all that happens. It is only by the lamb that the mercy seat is activated and that I can bear to have the ark born. That makes sense. Yes. And I pray that this goes out around the world mm. and that many people will hear it and receive it. Because I think what happens is that we get bits and pieces of stuff through through church doctrine and the puzzle is never put together. And that's why mm. people are stuck. Mm. There, there, there's some stuff here that I, I knew of, but I never put it together that way. So I'm thinking, so how many people don't even understand because they're only getting bits and pieces because they don't know how to connect it. So I'm praying that when this goes out, that it will just yeah. be intensified yeah. more like a flood and pierce the hearts and minds of people to want more, to understand more. Because I remember when I first was saved, you learned about coming out of Egypt, coming out of your old yeah. lifestyle. You yeah. understand <laughs> about crossing through the Jordan. And that, it stops right there. And then we get more bits and pieces based on seasons, based on man's seasons, and not the order of the Lord. Right. So I'm just praying that that really goes out, because that blessed my <laughs> socks off. I came here tired, but I tell you what, I'm wide awake. <laughs> Woo! Because this was, yeah. this was good, mm -hmm. because it really connected good. the dots, so now yeah. I know how to help yeah. somebody else to right. grasp the understanding of yeah. uh, what this season yeah. is about. Amen. So right. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for pressing yeah. through. Ah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. You take, take heart, right? But I, I want you to take this away because I'm going to have to deal with this too. And that is just the question is, Lord, what's my Jordan? What, what, what right? You, you're doing that, right? You understand it's an ongoing promise. We get over, there's, there's, there's provision that God has made. We walk into some promise and then we tend to go, we kind of slide back and we got to take this other part of us. Okay. Another layer of the onion. Okay, God, how do I pick up the cross today? What do I have to do? How do I get into the Jordan now? What's the memorial stone? Do you understand this is a process? It's why God brings us back around to this again and again and again every year. But I also am so intrigued at why God linked not only getting out of Egypt, but with getting into the promised land. He never, even though there's 40 years in between, he links them in time specifically in the first month so that you'll understand. Okay, don't forget you're getting out of here so that you'll get here. And the same month I took you out of here, I took and put your people in. So it's all here. See, this is the totality of the gospel we should be doing at an Easter, quote, Easter service, right? It's not just a salvation message. It's what's more. What's, what's the next God has for the rest of you who are sitting on your... Duffs and you're going, I know Jesus, I got Jesus, so what? I'm good. My insurance card is paid. And those many died in the wilderness because they did not combine faith. There's lots of people that need to have head knowledge, but not heart knowledge. Right, a willingness not to just even, but even I think of the head knowledge is interesting. I think most, I never had anybody explain this to me that there were two C's. Mm -hmm. I just thought they were just kind of the same thing. They're very different. They're very different objectives. Yeah, like, oh, uh -huh. just doing it again. Yeah, not. yeah, there's not. not there's, there's more, because it's the promise, and it's the area that you're to conquer and the territory that you're to take. And also, since Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit in the Jordan, and that's a symbol there. There you go. The yes. baptism mm -hmm. of the Holy there you Spirit, go. Yeah. which a lot of people <coughs> get to. 
Yeah. Yeah. Again, otherwise we're going to do we're going to try to do Jesus ministry but in the flesh. <coughs> and we if we do that, then we end up becoming very much like the Israelites. We do certain things out there in the desert and we just keep getting stuck. We can't cross over. <laughs> Okay, so let's pray. Put your hands in front if you want something from God. Father, I just ask right now for a word to each person who is open about a Jordan they've got to come into. Not because you're trying to kill them off per se, but because you want them to have more life. And so something's got to die in order to move into that more. Lord, let us learn why you have linked these in the deepest way. And that we are not alone. We carry now the presence of the Holy One. Lord, move and stir your word afresh. Mobilize all of your body. Help us to cross, cross, cross again and again and again into all that you have. Father, again, we release your healing strength and power. All those who couldn't be here tonight, but who are in spirit. And we just ask that they would be raised up afresh and encouraged to your glory. Amen.